everybody. Hi. So this is Mary Ann Harvey. I'm from the Nebraska CIP, and I'd like to welcome you to the webinar, Crossover Youth 101 for Nebraska Stakeholders. The goal of this webinar is to inform all Nebraska juvenile court professionals about what crossover is and how to handle case practice ahead of the statewide rollout of crossover policies for DHHS and probation staff. We are very fortunate to have an exciting lineup of presenters today. First, Shay Belchek and Michael M. Pierre from Georgetown Center on Juvenile Justice Reform, who have partnered with Nebraska since 2012 to pilot the crossover use practice model in five counties. As experts on crossover, they will start us off with an overview of the model. Next, Amy Latshaw from Probation and Monica Dement from DHHS will talk about the processes involved in the statewide rollout of crossover and their plan to train their entire staff across the state this summer. Next, we will hear from a variety of stakeholders from the pilot sites who will share their experiences with crossover in their communities. Tara Sturz from the Douglas County Attorney's Office, Don Rocky with Lancaster Costa, and Judge Larry Gimler from Parfi County. Finally, we will hear what has been done to evaluate the crossover model here in Nebraska by Dr. Emily Wright at UNO. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we start. Um, please be sure to mute your line so that we can avoid any feedback. To do that, you'll press star six. Or if you're listening through um, the computer, there's a little microphone icon at the top, and you can click on that and mute your um, computer speaker. Um, the presenters will address question and answer at the end of the webinar if there's time. Um, so to ask a question, please type it in the chat box that you see to the right um, in, on your screen. Um, you can type the questions in as they come to you throughout the presentation. We'll then read out loud the questions at the end of the webinar, and then the presenters will either answer, or if we run out of time, we'll download the questions, have the answers written down, and then we'll email them out to all of the participants um, within the next week. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube page as well. By next. With that, I'll turn this over to Shay and Michael to start us off. Hello, everybody. We're delighted to be with you today and to be able to participate in this statewide conference. Uh, we're very excited about the work underway in Nebraska uh, working on crossover youth, or also known as duly involved youth. Obviously, a number of counties have been formally involved with us work, and we're going to highlight some of that today. Uh, but as the state now is adopting statewide policy and practice, it gives us a further opportunity to really knowledge around crossover youth and improve policy and practice in the state of Nebraska. So I'm very excited to be with you today and part of this work. Um, when we look at the, um, we're going to move on to the next slide. When we look at the population of young people, I don't know if we are able to, oh yeah, there we go. Um, I want to give you a backdrop of how we worked on this issue here at Georgetown University. I'm a lawyer by training. I was a prosecuting attorney for 16 years and then worked at a policy level at the U.S. Department of Justice and the Child Welfare League of America. While we knew there was a correlation between children who were abused and neglected and those who later became involved in delinquency, uh, we did not know necessarily what the best practices would be to try to prevent that crossing over from occurring. So through a variety of, of steps that we took here, and I'm not going to go into a great deal on them, we ended up commissioning a uh, paper which became the Crossover Youth Practice Model looking at uh, what are the best practices and policies associated with crossover youth and how to prevent that crossover from happening. That is supported by a compendium we put together authored by Denise Herz and Joe Ryan uh, from uh, the academic community, uh, then it developed the practice model through a uh, retreat wing spread conference that we conducted back in May of 2008, eventually resulting in the practice model that we're going to be talking about uh, today. Uh, it is the foundation for the training and technical assistance work that we've done at Georgetown in now over 100 plus communities. So with that, let me go on to talk about crossover youth and exactly who they are. Um, so we can just clearly define the population of young people that we're talking about. So the population in this slide that we're really focused on are those kids in the middle rung. Now you can focus more broadly. Um, or narrowly, but what we want to look at are kids that are duly involved. We want to look at the children who are known to both the child welfare system and the juvenile justice system, either currently or in recent time. 
But that's where we really can bring the two systems together to make a difference in how well we serve those young people. Uh, yes, it is important to think about uh, those kids who are duly adjudicated, so adjudicated dependent and adjudicated delinquent in both systems. Um, and it's important to look at kids who are more globally involved in both being uh, involved in delinquent behavior and having been abused and neglected. Uh, those are interesting populations for us to focus on. But we look at that population where systems, by changing their behavior, can improve outcomes. And that's that duly involved population. Again, those kids involved at the same time in both child welfare and juvenile justice, or in recent time, having been involved in both. The next slide. Um, when we think about the population, we want to understand what are the ramifications? Why is it so important to focus on this population? Uh, how prevalent is the population? Uh, when we look prospectively, when we look at the population of young people in the child welfare system and think about what percentage of them will become involved in the delinquency system, this isn't just about delinquent behavior, but formally involved in the delinquency system through an arrest, it's anywhere from 10 to 29 percent. This is a product of a variety of studies that have been done uh, studying this issue. When we look retrospectively, if we look backwards from the juvenile justice system, as to how many of those kids who were involved in juvenile justice had some child welfare involvement earlier or concurrently in their life, it's almost two-thirds. So again, prospective versus retrospective, clearly a population that we need to pay attention to. Next slide. So what are the characteristics of the population? What do, we, what do we know about the population? So one is that we know girls are overrepresented in the population compared to their representation in juvenile justice more broadly. So for example, if you look at your statistics in Nebraska as to what percentage of, of girls are your juvenile justice population, my guess is it would be somewhere in the 25, 26, 27 percent. But if you look at the girls, in the crossover population, those that are crossed over from child welfare, it's more likely around one-third or so. And, and there might be some data presented later uh, in the webinar on, on the exact statistics. But broadly, nationally, girls are overrepresented in the crossover population. Children are We also know that there's an earlier on of delinquent behavior. Um, so that when we look at the general population and when their delinquency career begins, it's generally a year older than the kids who move into delinquent behavior from child welfare. So generally about 0.9 or almost one year difference in the onset. Uh, we know that there are educational issues that these kids face, other kids don't face as, as readily. Uh, academic behavior problems, suspension, expulsion, truancy, a litany of academic and behavioral problems at school that tend to surface. Uh, we also know that, that many of them have very high rates of involvement in mental health issues and in substance use problems. So we see in this population of crossover, 83% of the kids will either be diagnosed with a mental health condition, substance use problem, or co-occurring disorder, which is higher than the individual changes in child welfare or juvenile justice alone. So in, in, in essence, this population ends up with a, a more complex and higher set of needs than some other children might have in those systems individually. And then next slide. Further, what is correlated with crossover, we see that whether a child is abused and neglected persistently from early childhood on or adolescent limited maltreatment, uh, there's an equal uh, possibility that they will cross over. So oftentimes we thought historically it would be the children abused from early age onward or likely to cross over. What we've learned from the research is that even kids who have not been abused at an earlier age who experience abuse in adolescence and then the system have an equal crossing over. We also know that we have um, a, a tendency to see an absence of positive pro-social, positive youth development type opportunities for the kids who cross over. So the things that feed normal adolescent development, that nurture a child's pro-social behavior, often are lost. They've been abused and neglected, either because it's not present in their own home, or when they become, in child, become involved in child welfare, they're losing that as a, an aspect of their child welfare experience. Um, placement type, whether it is, um, uh, makes a difference in terms of placement type, we found that it does. Uh, congregate placements, group placements, seem to be correlated higher 
with crossover than family-based placement. So while it's difficult for any child to be removed from their home, the type of placement makes a difference. So trying to keep kids in a, in a relative caregiver placement, in a foster family, as opposed to a group placement makes a difference. And then the placement and in school instability. Every time a child moves in placement, every time they change schools, it increases the probability that they will regress in terms of their development and increase the probability that they will end up in the uh, juvenile justice system. Then my next slide. Uh, when they do touch the juvenile justice system, I want to talk about uh, that cross-system involvement. We see that oftentimes these young people uh, get access to diversion at lower rates. I don't think this is intentional, but oftentimes when people are looking at a diversion program as a possibility for a child moving from child welfare to juvenile justice, they often think there may not be an appropriate candidate for diversion. Their needs might be too complex. Uh, they may not be able to afford the, the program admission fee. They may not be able to get transported to the community service site. So this is something we want to analyze, county to county. Uh, do kids get an equal shot at diversion and then an equal shot at success of diversion? Um, they generally tend to have higher rates of system referrals. And then when they are referred, higher rates of detention. Uh, so oftentimes they're disrupting emplacement and they end up in detention pending a delinquency case. So we want to make sure we are approaching um, how to deal with those detention situations uh, in a fair way, as well as higher rates of adjudication and higher rates of residential placement. So in, in short term, what we're seeing is these kids tend to progress at an earlier age into the delinquency system and then propel more deeply into the system than other kids in similar circumstances but for their child welfare involvement. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael to talk a little bit about how we are approaching these issues. Great. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michael Lampierre. I'm the Deputy Director for Juvenile Justice System Improvement here at the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown University. And I've been working closely with Jay and the teams in Nebraska to implement uh, the practice model over the number of years that we've been with you. And it's been an absolute privilege to do that. And we are so delighted and excited that this, uh, this webinar is taking place as there's more of a statewide movement um, to uh, think about this population in a more intentional way through the development of policies and supports throughout the state. We know that um, in Nebraska there is a deep commitment to improving outcomes for young people and families who touch the various systems. And we've been consistently impressed um, with that level of commitment and dedication. So the fact that you're spending uh, some time with us today to talk more about this effort uh, is a testament to you all, and, and we thank you again for being with us. Um, next slide, please. Um, you know, all of these issues that Shay just um, set forth in terms of the challenges that we see with the crossover youth population, um, this notion that in many ways crossover youth um, nationally, from what we know from the data, are not uh, benefiting from an equal playing field really stems from the traditional approach that we have taken in serving uh, young people who touch multiple systems. And what we have seen nationally is this uh, siloed approach to essentially serving the same population of young people. We know that these are the same uh, youth and the same families who are touching systems. But unfortunately, traditionally what we have seen in our field is that each uh, respective system handles those young people and families respectively. And there hasn't been that commitment to cross-system communication and collaboration and partnership. And that ultimately is what the crossover youth practice model is all about. At the end of the day, what we're talking about is increasing communication, collaboration, and coordination of the various partners who play a role in serving these young people and their families. Um, and when I say partners, um, primarily, you know, there's a, there's a strong focus on thinking about both uh, juvenile justice and child welfare personnel, your probation department, your child welfare workers, and respective providers. But it's absolutely essential as we're thinking about a more integrated approach to serving this population that we're also collaborating and communicating and partnering with other essential partners, including judges, including attorneys, um, both county attorneys and prosecutors and defense attorneys and attorneys for young people and families who are involved in the delinquency and dependency systems. Um, it's essential that we're talking about collaborating with CASAs 
and guardians ad litem, educators, uh, behavioral health staff, right, those clinicians that are thinking about substance use and mental health issues, uh, law enforcement, community-based providers and advocacy organizations, and of course, uh, partnering with young people and families themselves. So really this, this entire effort when we're talking about envisioning a different way of serving the, these young people and families in a more holistic way, it's about bringing all of those partners to the table to fashion a more unified and coordinated approach to service delivery and, and to um, the way that uh, young people and families experience the systems. If we do this right, and we have seen it done well all around the country, but if we do it right, if we're coordinating and collaborating in the way that's envisioned by the practice model, what we know is that we'll see a maximization of our resources, our very precious resources that we have available to us in, in our systems. We can maximize those resources. We can optimize them. We will lessen the burdens that we often see that are placed on young people and families in terms of their various obligations with reporting to court and uh, maintaining the various appointments and assessments that they're subject to as part of the process. We'll begin to lessen those burdens as we streamline and coordinate those and ultimately, we will see improvement in the outcomes that we care about. We will see improvement in public safety and recidivism numbers. We'll see improvement in um, the way that young people attain uh, rates of education and employment, all of those positive youth outcomes that, that we know are essential in order to support young people as they make the transition into adulthood. So ultimately, that is what the practice model is designed to do. Um, and the work that we have, uh, we have led in partnership with communities um, like uh, the various uh, counties in Nebraska all around the country have seen that really focusing on this in an integrated, coordinated way can lead to those outcomes. Next slide, please. So what does the practice model uh, focus on? Here on this slide, you see the various components of uh, practice and policy and approaches that we, we talk about and work with communities when we're implementing the practice model. For us, it begins with the question of prevention. So despite the fact that we are focused on the, the moment of crossover, the fact of you know, thinking about the traditional pathway, that what we see is young people who are child welfare involved, who then become um, involved with the justice system via arrest or citation. That's that point of crossover. But even before we get to that point, we have to be thinking about the opportunities to prevent that crossover from taking place in the first place. So the practice model um, begins in many ways with this notion of prevention. How do we analyze the areas in which um, young people may be involved that are ultimately leading them to the justice system? Are we able to analyze those hot spots, the referral sources, to think about where young people who are child welfare involved may be getting arrested and why that's happening, and then to develop targeted solutions there, you know, throughout. And so for us, prevention is an important element of this work, and we'd be remiss to be talking about better coordination and collaboration if we're not intentionally focusing on efforts designed to keep young people out of the justice system in the first place. Once that moment of crossover has occurred, the second bullet that you see on the screen here is about identification. And there what the practice model really lifts up is the importance of having clear protocols around how we go about identifying those youth and sharing that information across partners. So in a traditional siloed approach, what you might have um, are uh, systems where the young people who are involved in the child welfare system are well known to the child welfare agency. And those who are involved in the justice system um, and probation, for example, are well known to probation, but you may not have that, that level of communication that you would like to see. So what the practice model says is, as soon as possible, let's share that information, let's identify those young people who are touching multiple systems, and let's create structures and processes so that um, we're not dependent on personalities, for example. In many jurisdictions, what we see is that you may have an individual who's just, who understands the importance of strong communication across partners. What the practice model is about is about 
systemizing that process in a more formal way and having structures in place so that well, when that young person crosses over, we can be emailing, we can be calling, we can be accessing each other's databases so we have that understanding of who the population is. Because if we don't know who the population is as a starting point, we're not able to do that coordination. The information sharing piece of the third bullet that you see on the screen is also critical. This really speaks to the need of having a strong understanding of what is supported by law in terms of what information can be shared across the various systems. And so jurisdictions that we work with conduct this legal analysis to see what can be shared to whom um, and how to do it. And typically we um, think about it, uh, this process being done through law, by court order or consent. And Judge Gendler, we'll hear from Judge Gendler in, in a few minutes to talk about um, you know, how Sarpy County in particular approached this question of information sharing. But it's essential that all partners have a common understanding of uh, what information can be shared and, and how to do it in a way that respects uh, privacy and confidentiality while still supporting this ultimate goal of collaboration. As Shay mentioned, um, given the, the national research that shows that crossover youth are detained at higher rates than their counterparts, it's also important that we focus on detention as part of the practice model. And so the model does um, talk about the importance of looking at those detention rates and to the extent that crossover youth are facing higher rates of detention in your respective jurisdictions, that we're fashioning strategies to address that. In many jurisdictions, this means building off of the work that's led by the Annie E. Casey Foundation through their JDAI initiative, as well as uh, those jurisdictions that are working with the Burns Institute around um, these issues. But thinking about data collection around detention, thinking about training around uh, implicit bias and development, um, all of that comes into play. The practice model also talks about the importance of looking at charging decisions. So Shay mentioned the, the various uh, disparities that crossover youth face uh, around the country. And again, we're speaking nationally here, not necessarily in Nebraska. But um, what we know is that young people who are crossover um, do not experience the benefit of diversion at equal rates to their counterparts. So being very thoughtful about uh, why that may be taking place, asking the question whether it's taking place in the first place, and then um, developing strategies to address any gaps in practice. We have to be very thoughtful about eligibility requirements for diversion and, and how that might have a disparate impact on crossover youth. And then when young, once young people are placed on diversion, making sure that they have the supports to succeed and to successfully complete those diversionary programs. So this notion of having uh, a fully informed charging decision, um, and we'll be hearing from uh, Kara Sturtz in a few minutes as well to talk about um, the great work that's happening in uh, Douglas County around a teaming approach to inform some of those decisions. And, and from our perch, really a, a national model in many ways in um, coordinating this, uh, this information gathering piece with respect to the charging decision. The court structure and approaches uh, bullet that you see on the screen is contemplated by the practice model. Again, here what we're talking about is how do we fashion a court process that is coordinated, that maximizes resources, that lessens burdens on young people and families. And the practice model talks about various models that can be used uh, to support this, including the one judge, one family model, this notion that a single judge would track the young person and the family, whether it's uh, about the dependency matter or the delinquency matter, that it's the same judge that is tracking the youth and the family throughout. And that really, again, is a, is a resource maximization strategy, really lessens burdens on families, and um, streamlines the process. Um, other jurisdictions have implemented a dedicated docket approach um, where you have a designated docket within the court process, uh, particularly in larger jurisdictions, specifically on crossover youth. Teaming is an absolute essential uh, element of the practice model, and you're going to hear more um, from your counterparts. Um, Don Rocky uh, is going to be giving us a little bit of the CASA perspective um, and how CASAs have been uh, brought into that teaming approach um, in Nebraska. But for us, this really speaks to the need for having that multidisciplinary uh, teaming approach through the various stages of the process to ensure that we're offering a strength-based 
approach to case planning and service delivery and really bringing the partners to the table who understand and who have the ability to provide that context to the young person's life and the life of the family that really is essential when you're fashioning your strategies moving forward. Um, you see on the, on the top right the bullet of, of aligned assessment and case planning. Um, again, this speaks to the need of coming together. We know that, that crossover youth um, tend to experience assessment processes um, that may be fragmented, that each system may be doing their own thing. How do we come together to at least utilize that information in a more streamlined way um, so that, again, we're lessening burdens on youth and families and we're really optimizing our resources? Coordinated case management, and again, we're going to hear more from Amy and Monica about how this is being contemplated at the state level in Nebraska, um, among other, other areas that you see reflected on the screen. But here what we're talking about is how do we get the partners at the table to communicate uh, more frequently and in a more systematic uh, way? How do we ensure that there's coordination with respect to court hearings? How do we respect, uh, make sure that there's coordination with respect to family visits? Um, how do we uh, think through the various responsibilities and which agency will take the lead, um, which agencies and what their roles will be? Having clear criteria around closing cases. These are all elements of the coordinated case management approach. And you'll hear more from Monica and Amy about um, how this will look like at the state level. Youth and family engagement is absolutely essential. Um, we know across the board that our outcomes are better if we are truly and meaningfully engaging young people and families throughout. And so for us, this piece um, has to be done. And you know whether you're doing it individually in child welfare or in juvenile justice or in education or behavioral health, we know across the board, the research tells us, that our outcomes are better when families and youth are engaged in a meaningful way. Uh, DMC and DMR uh, issues are also important, this notion of fairness, so focusing on that, specifically uh, with the lens of crossover youth, given what the national data show. Again, focusing on data collection and a training as essential strategies here. And then finally, this notion of permanency is something that the practice model lifts up. Permanency being not just a place, but a state of being. How do we support young people to have those long-standing connections with the individuals um, that we know will be with them long after they're, they're involved with the system? How do we set up those relationships now? How do we um, provide opportunities for skill development to support that self-sufficiency? These are the, the types of practices that the practice model lifts up. Next slide, please. So um, here you see reflected on this screen, this is the process that we, uh, we undertake when we work with jurisdictions all around the country. Again, it begins with the development of these multidisciplinary, multi-system leadership teams that guide the work. So again, we're talking about bringing together juvenile justice, child welfare, judges, attorneys, educators, CASAs, GALs, behavioral health, law enforcement, community-based providers, youth and families together to identify ways that we are really doing this work in a strong way, as well as those opportunities to do it better. And this is exactly the process that we undertook um, in Nebraska, and you'll hear more about what that is. Um, as part of that process, one initial step is conducting a gap analysis. We work with jurisdictions and we say, here is what the practice model sets forth in terms of these key practices and approaches. How are you doing vis-a-vis -vis those best practices set forth in the practice model? And to the extent that there are any gaps in practice or in policy, that is where the development of protocols and the development of policies, as well as training and ongoing efforts around quality assurance, really becomes important. And you'll see that each county that has embarked with us on this work has developed a set of governing documents and protocols that sets forth those practice expectations and then um, utilizes those documents to support training, to support the QA, and to support the, this notion of data collection and evaluation so that we know that the strategies that are being implemented are leading to better outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, what we know uh, from our work in, in the various jurisdictions around the country, here you see them reflected on the screen. It has been an absolute privilege uh, here at the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform to be working with so many states and jurisdictions around the country on this work. But as I mentioned, um, it really is worth the investment and the time. We know that it, is, um, it, takes, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes staffing, but the outcomes are worth it. Next slide. 
Um, we uh, have had the benefit of having an evaluation done on the work uh, that we have done in partnership with these sites on the crossover youth practice model. Um, and we looked at uh, you know, a number of sites um, to conduct one, one evaluation. This was led by Denise Hers and Liz Barnett uh, in California. We looked at over 1,500 young people who had gone through uh, sites, uh, a total of 19 jurisdictions that had implemented the practice model. Um, and ultimately, we wanted to ask the question um, whether there was any demonstrable impact on the work. And they looked at a cohort of young people who had gone through their systems prior to the implementation of the practice model, compared it to a cohort of young people who had gone through it after the strategies had been implemented. And what you see reflected on the screen are the outcomes that we saw in those jurisdictions, um, starting with education. Uh, again, looking at 19 uh, jurisdictions, what we found was that the vast majority of, of jurisdictions found uh, significant improvement in educational outcomes, including attendance or completion of school, improved behavioral issues at school, and improved academ uh, ac academic progress as well. We saw that um, jurisdictions saw uh, increased improvements in engaging in pro-social activities. So we're talking about things like after-school programs, sports, art, involvement in religious activities, mentoring. Um, we saw that those rates increase. Um, the jurisdictions reported significant improvement in substance use and mental health issues as well. Um, you see reflected on the screen the use of diversion and dismissal. Sites um, reported significant increases there as well, sort of leveling that playing field that I was talking about. Um, and, then, uh, on the, uh, and then we also saw um, increases um, in connections to stable relationships with adults, parents, family members, mentors, teachers, and coaches, um, and, and leading to increased rates of home placement and reunification. Uh, the evaluation also showed reductions in recidivism, um, measured by both uh, new arrests and new sustained petitions. And we also saw a reduction in the use of um, alternative uh, permanent plan living arrangement as a permanency goal. So across the board, the investment is worth it. Now, we also um, have the benefit of, of hearing from Dr. Wright on this webinar, and we'll hear more specifically about the data that we're seeing from Nebraska in particular, which is really powerful. Wonderful that you all have a resource in UNO to lead an evaluation, an independent evaluation of the work um, in Nebraska as well. Next slide. Um, we, in addition to Nebraska and Minnesota, there also was an evaluation of the work done. Um, and again, very affirming uh, uh, results here. Um, the county that was uh, I, the focus of this study was not identified um, in, in the uh, study for purposes of privacy and confidentiality. Um, but what they found in this particular county uh, was that young people were much less likely to recidivate. Um, after the implementation of the practice model. Again, this focus on public uh, safety, really important. Um, they also conducted a separate study that looked at the experiences of professionals who went through the practice model, and 99% of the participants reported positive structural changes in the way that they were conducting service delivery. So we are just delighted um, that, uh, next slide please, we're just delighted that, that Nebraska has embarked uh, on this process with us. Here you see some action shots. We see Amy in action there. Amy, we're going to hear from you in just a second. Um, we see uh, Corey. We see Judge Gendler reflected there as well, as, as well as others. Um, it has been truly our privilege to be working in Dodge, Douglas, Lancaster, Gage, and Sarpy, and now as we move to a statewide focus. So with that, um, I, would, I would love to uh, turn it over uh, now. Um, to Amy and Monica to talk a little bit more. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Amy Latshaw. I'm a juvenile justice specialist in our administrative office of probation. I'll let uh, Monica introduce herself here in just a moment. Um, I do have to say, as much as Michael and Shay, that it's been a privilege to work with us, uh, it's been an invaluable experience working with them, to be able to have um, what I consider not only national but international experts in juvenile justice helping to guide us through this process. Um, has been incredible, and I think any any of our CYPM sites that are active would would uh, echo that sentiment as, as well. As you can see in looking at our map, when we we've circled our five crossover practice model sites, 
And when we look at population, probably this represents about two-thirds of our crossover youth in the state. So we knew population-wise this was where we really wanted to focus on formal implementation of the model in its purest form from Georgetown. But obviously, geographically, you can see the rest of the state is not covered very well. And so then the discussion became, how do we get the best practices of the model to all of our other 88 counties? The crossover process, as Michael outlined, it is, it's uh, an in-depth process. It's a rather lengthy process to get to implementation. A lot of those uh, sites took a year. So we knew it just really wasn't going to be feasible for each individual county, which this really wanted to be a county-based implementation process. It wasn't going to be feasible for that to happen. The nice thing is in Nebraska, we had a really unique opportunity in the fact that we have our child welfare and juvenile justice primary agencies are statewide agencies. And we all have guiding practices and protocols that guide our day-to-day -day work. So we embarked on a mission to see how could we implement the best pieces of the crossover youth practice model into our overarching day-to-day -day work together. From the Administrative Office of Probation, Department of Child and Family Services, which is a, a division of the Department of Health and Human Services, which is our child welfare agency, along with the Court Improvement Project, we got a team together and our first step was to really talk about the foundation of what we believe. And what we believe is on your slide. That to effectively address needs and improve outcomes for youth, we're dedicated to first improving cross-system practice, to really looking to strength-based family engagement in all the phases of what we do, align resources. Um, early on, Shane Michael talked about the fact that um, without this kind of good collaboration, we tend to duplicate services. It's much more difficult for the family, and it's not always fiscally responsible. So we wanted to make sure that this practice um, helped that issue. Also, we wanted to seek opportunities at every juncture to divert youth from dual system involvement. Whether that means a youth that we're just experiencing in either of our systems, or youth that we already have that are currently duly adjudicated and we're involved with them at the same time, how can we look at removing one of us from that case if, um, if it's prudent to do so? At the same time, I think we recognize the fact that there are youth that need both systems involved with them. Um, that's one thing that I think um, the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform really helped us with in the fact that there are, it's okay. Sometimes there are times when that is a very needed situation, but it only really should occur if there's really purposeful discussions around why and everybody understands what particularly their role is in uh, reducing risk in each of their areas. So what we did is we decided let's take those evidence-based practices that CJJR really outlined nicely in the practice model and let's infuse them in all phases of our daily work. We know, knowing that, we're going to be looking at the similar outcomes as the model itself, which is um, enabling the success for the youth and family, and also uh, accomplishing our mission for community safety. So for the first time, we sat down and we figured the best way to do this is to take our guiding documents in both of our um, areas. So for the Administrative Office of Probation, we have policies and protocols. For DCFF, they have DCFS, they have administrative memorandums. We actually sat down, Monica and I, side by side, and wrote these with the same expectations. We spoke to each of our various systems in the language that we talk and working within our processes, but the expectations around time frames, team meetings, how um, products are going to go to the court together how we're going to work with the families together to come up with recommendations and case plans. All of that is spelled out in these guiding documents in each of our, um, each of our respective systems. We had a lot of help in doing this. 
uh, Monica and I really put the details together, but we had a lot of our um, staff that are in the active crossover practice sites helped us because they've already test driven this. They've already written their individual protocols uh, to implement the crossover youth practice model. So they were able to glean a lot of things for us to say these are the things that really um, are going to work for us statewide with our, with our current processes. Court Improvement Project obviously was a great partner in this as well and coordinate with the Eyes of the Child team. And what you're trying to come up with, um, as far as your local area is enabled, uh, enabling more of your ability to impact court processes for juvenile justice as well as child welfare. So I think that's our hope is that when this um, overarching, and, and Monica will share a little bit more about how we are going to now implement this with our staff, but it's our hope that they then will be able to um, verse really well how it's working in their world within your IS teams and, and help with those additional steps you would like to take locally. Uh, obviously, uh, the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform has been instrumental in helping us look at what would this statewide perspective uh, look at. Uh, from what Shay and Michael tell us, we're, we're kind of groundbreaking in the fact that we're, we're implementing statewide. Um, maybe not in the purest form of the model, but um, trying to get uh, those best practices statewide. Again, everything that we have done and um, the slide that we'll show you next, Monica will kind of talk to you and you can see a lot of the actual principles that Michael and Shay have already went over, um, how they are interwoven into what we are going to do. Also, we were very purposeful to make sure that whatever we were doing in probation, whatever we were doing in child welfare, is going to actually still keep intact what is going on in our local crossover sites. Um, this will be just simply complementing what they do um, and ensuring that our particular staffs are still meeting the expectations that we've set forth in these new policies, protocols, and administrative memorandum. And I'm Monica DeMent. I am the child, one of the Child and Family Service Administrators for the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and this slide that, I, that we are showing right now um, is actually a resource that's available on the Court Improvement Project website. Um, and it provides a really good example of just a summary of what the work between HHS and probation is going to look like when we have youth that are, are identified as crossover. One of the very first things that we really look at doing is making sure that we're properly identifying those kids that are crossing over. Um, a good piece of that is going to be making sure that we are first engaging the family um, on both sides of it to, to make sure that we're allowing the family the opportunity to identify themselves that they are working with both either probation or HHS or both. Um, then what we're also going to do is then a system check in the databases that we both have so that if the family maybe doesn't tell us, doesn't know, or, or doesn't want to reveal that information, that we are still doing that cross-check to make sure that we don't miss any of the kids that um, would actually be identified as crossover. Then the next piece of that identification is really making sure that we have the authorization secured so that we can immediately share that information between the two entities um, through releases of information that are done by the parents, through court orders by the judge, through state statute, there are areas where we have the ability to do that sharing. And then the other piece of that is really making sure that we have that timely contact, that initial contact between HHS and probation, and that initial contact with the family, so that we can then begin that process of really doing that aligned assessment and planning. So that next section, is it has a couple of different areas. So we're really looking at what does that assessment and planning look like in an emergency situation. So when youth come to the detention center or when a youth uh, when HHS has gone out and, and determined that a youth is not safe in their home and we need to do a safety plan. Um, then that next piece is really that, in, that formal investigation that is done by both HHS and probation in our different areas and making sure that we are getting that collaboration um, and getting that collateral information from HHS and probation to make sure that our assessments that are done on both areas are done thoroughly and completely with the information that either probation or HHS might have regarding um, the work with that family. Then another big piece of that is, is that active supervision of the case, making sure that um, we are doing team meetings together, making sure that families understand that when we come out to, to visit, we're going to be coming out together as much as possible. 
One, to make sure that that communication is consistent with families so that they don't get mixed messages. Two, to make sure that the services that are getting set up are being set up consistently with what the family needs and to not duplicate each other. And then another key piece of that is making sure that then we are um, really doing that collaborative report to the court to let them know this is what we know about the family, these are the things that we're working on with the family, and these are the goals that we see for the family. And that, that report is done together so that the court gets a consistent message that both entities are really working on that. Um, and then that next piece is really that coordinated case management. Kind of talked about that already with the family team meetings. But another key piece of that is going to be making sure that um, the kids, when we go and talk to kids, that we are, are talking to them together and making sure that when they get that feedback back before we leave their house or their school or that court hearing, that the family knows exactly what they need to do next, that they know who to contact for what sort of situation. Um, so families don't get confused and, and end up doing services twice or, or doing extra work that's not needed. Um, the other piece of this is really that shared court responsibility, that when there is a hearing occurring for the juvenile justice case, the HHS caseworker is there so that they don't have to wonder what happened in the court hearing. They already know because they're there. And on the same side, when um, there's a child abuse neglect uh, review hearing, um, that portion of the case, that, that probation is also there so that they're aware of what's occurring and they know what's being recommended. The bottom part of that flowchart is really talking about that collaborative case consultation. And what that is is really looking at maintaining effective uh, system partnerships, so really meeting together to identify those system issues that might be occurring that cause crossover to not work the way it should. Also looking at um, just that supervisory consultation across the board from the beginning of the case to the end of the case. When you're getting ready to close that case, that we are having a meaningful supervisory consultation between HHS and probation that says, yeah, we're ready to either have one or the other or both entities step out of the family's life and making sure that we have those goals that we identify at the very beginning met, that those kids are safe, that we've um, identified services that maybe need to continue on to make sure that they're safe in the community and in their home. And then also really looking at um, those permanency um, issues for kids, making sure that they are in a permanent place and it's going to be maintaining them, that's going to be able to carry on any um, successful changes that we have made in working with the family and with the youth, carrying on so that they don't come back into the system. So our next steps, now that we have created our administrative uh, memorandum and policies protocol, is really bringing this out to our direct care. Um, between HHS and probation, we have about 850 direct um, line supervisory and administrative staff, they're going to be trained in their local areas together um, across the state between July and September of this year. One of the key things that we really wanted to focus on was making sure that um, those trainings are occurring at the local level, that we're not asking them to come clear across the state and train in a large, giant group that they maybe wouldn't get their active information. And so a big piece of that is that Amy and I are going to go on the road and, and explore Nebraska. And <laughs> come out to the local areas and really meet with those teams together. One of the key things that we really wanted was that the probation staff in the districts that um, work in those areas and the HHS staff in the offices that work in those areas are having that training together because a key piece of the training is going to really be that collaborative work on how are we going to ensure that these um, tenants that we've been training on with crossover are going to carry over into those local processes and the local practices that they're using. Um, we also wanted to have a portion of our training which really is going to focus on those kind of those tough topics, um, you know, placement of children, when kids get detained, um, struggles that you have when, when one wants to close a case and one says we're not ready. Kind of working as a team in interactive activities in that training to figure out how are we going to handle those situations when they occur. Um, kind of helping launch those, those officers and workers into brainstorming. How are we going to make sure that we're still following crossover um, and that the kids and the families that we're working with, that their needs are being met consistently. After we get all the trainings done for our direct staff, then um, we're going to be connecting back, wanting our, our workers and our administrators and our supervisors to get trained. We're wanting them to go back then to their through the eyes of the child teams and make sure that each of those teams 
gets a good understanding of the training that we've done and, and exploring those practices that we are learning as a team of how they're going to impact crossover use in, our, in each of those areas. Great. Thank you, Amy and Monica, for that great overview. We have a number of folks um, who have yet to speak, so we're going to try to get back on track here in terms of our time. Um, next, we're going to turn it over to uh, Kara Sturtz to give us a little bit of the county attorney's perspective um, on the work, and then we'll go from there. Folks, continue to send in your questions. We see that we just received one question. We'll have, we're hoping to reserve a few minutes at the end for Q&A, so please be sure to submit those. But with that, let me turn to, to Kara for her presentation. Thanks, Michael. Hi, everyone. You won't be able to see me because I don't have a webcam, so I apologize for that. But I'm happy to share my thoughts about the crossover youth practice model from my perspective as a Douglas County prosecutor. I will first describe how Douglas County handles crossover cases. Along with sitting on the crossover team, I'm responsible for reviewing all juvenile police reports and truancy referrals including reports for kids who are not identified crossover. For a non-crossover youth, I usually receive a police report that contains biographical information and a narrative regarding the charge, but I rarely receive any information from the youth or from anyone who is familiar with the youth. However, for crossover cases, I get a wealth of information before making a charging decision. Most of that information comes from our multidisciplinary team meetings which is what I will focus on today. I'm going to use the terms parent and family and guardian interchangeably because any of those people may accompany a youth to one of our meetings. Once I get a police report or a truancy referral for a youth who is identified as a crossover youth, unless there is an open delinquency docket or it's a sexual assault charge, I generally refer it to the crossover team. A meeting is scheduled, and the youth and a parent or guardian are invited to attend. When the youth and parent arrive for the meeting, family engagement begins immediately. The family is greeted by someone from the Nebraska Family Support Network, or NFSN, who explains the process and helps them complete the required paperwork. When the family is meeting with NFSN, the other professionals have a pre-staffing during which we each share the information we have. The team generally consists of a neutral, non-decision-making facilitator, along with people who represent probation, child welfare, diversion, and the county attorney's office. If we are reviewing a truancy, school personnel will be there as well. Sometimes a guardian ad litem or a therapist attends, or a good friend of the youth, or a mentor, or an older sibling. Anyone who can be an appropriate advocate for the youth is welcome. Shortly after our meeting starts, I explain to the youth that there are four possible outcomes and that he or she will get to participate in making the charging decision. Our four options include, one, we decline to prosecute and the charge is not pursued. Two, we decline to prosecute but we offer enhanced services or more than what the family is currently receiving. We don't provide any supervision, but we make referrals or give the family the contact information so they can make the connections themselves. Three, diversion. This option is similar to the second option in that we help arrange services, but we are also able to provide formal supervision. We develop a diversion plan as a team with input from the youth and the parents. If the plan is completed successfully, we decline to prosecute the charge. If not, professionals staff the case again and determine whether court intervention is necessary. Our fourth option is filing in juvenile court. If the youth refuses to engage in the meeting or to participate at all, or if the youth's needs are too high to be safely addressed through the supports of diversion, we usually choose to file on the charges in court. Regardless of the option that we choose, the youth and family will be able to ask questions and will leave the meeting with an explanation of the outcome. After I describe the four outcome options, the facilitator asks the youth to walk us through the day of the incident, including the charge and what led up to it. We give the youth a chance to share, and then it becomes a conversation. This gives us a more complete picture 
and we are often able to get to the why behind the incident and how the youth's history, including family dynamics and trauma, has contributed to the current behavior and choices. The kids we see often have significant trauma histories. Some have spent time in out-of-home care or have witnessed their parents' domestic violence or drug use or have been victims of sexual abuse or assault. The professionals who come to the table, including caseworkers, therapists, school personnel, and others, are able to tell the team about the results of evaluations, services that are currently in place, information about attendance and IEPs, informal supports that the family is utilizing, barriers that the family is facing, and factors that will be critical to the youth's success. The meetings are generally problem-solving collaborations. We always go into meetings with open minds, and we know that our interactions with the youth and family can change our minds from what, before the meeting, we thought may be the most appropriate outcome. Similarly, we often also see a youth or parent's mind change. Despite our efforts to help them feel comfortable before walking into the room, sometimes the youth and parents seem angry or defensive. The kids are fearful that they're going to get in more trouble. The parents also feel like they are in trouble, or they think we're going to tell them that they're bad parents. As we give our introductions and start the conversation and show the youth and family that we value their voices, their demeanors change. They become more open and willing to share. I'm still sometimes surprised at how honest they are while sharing about the events for which they were cited or family dynamics or other struggles. I remember a parent who, at the beginning of a meeting, said he thought that his daughter was lying and faking her school anxiety. And by the end of the meeting, he heard his daughter and was willing to let her participate in therapy and to work with school staff to address her needs. After each meeting, once the family leaves the room, the team gets an opportunity to debrief. We discuss what happened during the meeting, what went well, and what could have been, been handled differently. Particularly in the case of difficult meetings, this has been helpful. For example, if we had a meeting in which a youth shut down and started crying, or if we had divorced parents who weren't getting along, or a grandparent who wouldn't stop berating a child, it is during our post-meeting discussions that we developed informal procedures for how to handle those things when they happen again in the future. I've mentioned many benefits, including greater collaboration, trust, and information sharing among agencies, no duplication of services, and better outcomes. We've also faced challenges over the years. These include managing differing philosophies, youth or parents who don't want to talk with us, and imperfect resources. Additionally, occasionally skeptics comment that we are too soft or that now these kids won't take their offenses seriously. They don't understand how a prosecutor is comfortable letting a youth and family participate in deciding how to proceed with charges. However, we have found that scolding or shaming or a do this or else approach isn't likely to be successful. We need the buy-in and the willingness to engage from a youth and his or her parents. And by giving them a voice and including them as members of our team, we're able to come to a consensus and set the youth and family up for success. If we choose the third option, formal diversion, we put a unique plan in place. The plan depends on each youth's particular needs, and it can include anything from individual or family therapy to pro-social activities, to apology letters and mediation. I always make clear to the youth and family what is at stake, and I explain that the charge is still open and can be filed at any time if we see that he or she needs more structure and supervision. We expect the youth to take responsibility and to be held accountable for his or her actions. We rarely choose option number four, or immediate court intervention. Prosecution isn't usually necessary, as we are often able to come up with a plan to provide proper interventions and supports. However, in some cases, a youth or parent refuses to participate, or we're concerned about the safety of the youth or others, or we find that the youth's needs are too high for diversion supervision. 
a crossover case that is filed in court doesn't look drastically different than any other court case. The coordination and communication among the child welfare and juvenile justice systems begins even before a crossover case is filed. So there is continuity while moving into the court system, and case plans and the delivery of services are more seamless. We can give a judge the most comprehensive report about what interventions have already been tried and can formulate appropriate recommendations for moving forward. As a prosecutor, I always keep our community and public safety in mind while making decisions about charges. I'm also mindful of the best interests of the youth and families who participate in our team meetings. The joint coordinated assessment of our Douglas County crossover team allows me to make the most informed charging decisions possible. Whether we choose to provide no intervention, informal support, diversion, or court intervention, we do our best to address the risks, needs, and accountability while getting the best possible outcomes for the youth we serve. Thanks so much. You know, we, we at Georgetown, we've had the opportunity to feature Kara as a presenter at our national programs here. So the work that's happening in Douglas County is, is tremendous. We also have the opportunity to feature uh, Dawn's work um, at CASA. We recently put out a publication about the, the role of CASA in the crossover work, and um, the work in Nebraska was featured in that publication. So Dawn, we'd love to hear from your perspective, what does the crossover youth practice model work look like? Great, thank you. Um, it, CASA for Lancaster County has always served 3A youth as well as 3B youth, but um, frequently had kids that also had law violations. And if you look at the CASA statute, um, we are allowed to be uh, assigned to law violations as well. So with that in mind, when the pilot project started in Lancaster County, CASA um, was asked to be part of the implementation team, and I, and, and I may have asked to be part of the implementation team. Those of you who know me would be shocked by that. Um, but we have really enjoyed um, being part of this and looking for a better way to, to make sure that these kids don't get further system involved. Uh, approximately 25 to 30 youth in Lancaster County um, meet, of our youth, CASA youth, um, meet the definition of, of crossover, and um, CASA volunteers then are part of the team approach to working with these kids. Um, what are the roles of a CASA volunteers to make sure the youth is receiving the services they need um, and those that have been, have been ordered? Prior to the CYPM process, um, there were oftentimes um, services that probation is maybe working on or a service that HHS was working on um, that there wasn't a lot of information shared and sometimes no services got implemented because people weren't sure who was doing what. The process we have in place now really helps to solve that so that everybody's on the same page. Um, another role of ours is to ensure that the youth's voice is heard in court. So CASA volunteers provide written reports to the judge that include a section um, that is about the needs and wishes of the youth. A goal of our um, program overall is to help ensure that youth does not uh, re-enter the child welfare or juvenile justice system or become further enmeshed. And of course, the crossover youth are at the highest risk um, for re-entry, um, and this is shown in, in all of the uh, statistics. So we try to keep a, a really close eye on these cases. Initially, our role was kind of um, to provide anecdotal information as to um, how cases progress or fail to progress um, for crossover use. And um, initially, we were able to provide input on gaps uh, in service delivery and decision making. Um, a lot of times, Information wasn't going both ways. We now have um, protocol in place to make sure this doesn't happen. And as you can imagine, when information isn't shared, case progression is slowed, and it created a great deal of, of confusion um, for the youth and for their families not knowing what um, exactly they needed to do next. Um, 
we have been able to weigh in on the import, importance of joint team meetings and making sure that those were, were happening. Um, and we offer uh, to assist with finding, you know, finding out information, setting up um, services if needed, or contacting um, officials. So, um, you know, CASA is, is pretty involved. One quick example here is a, a young man whose abuse neglect case um, began when he was eight, and I'm sure you won't be shocked to find out that, that he did become further system involved um, over the next 11 years being in the, in the system. He had had 25 placements by the time he aged out, multiple schools um, in an out-of-state placement, um, and all of that, so that when he uh, was brought back to Lancaster County after having been out of state, we had no idea where he was at academically with high school credit. And so the CASA volunteer was um, very much involved in tracking down that credit information, getting um, the school district to agree on, okay, how much credit does he have, where is he at academically, and, and, and making sure that we had him in the right um, school program making sure that his IEP was up to date, and then um, getting him on a path to graduate. And I still consider it a huge uh, accomplishment that this young man graduated from high school. So I have pictures if anybody's interested. Um, CASA's role now, because now everybody's talking to each other, is uh, to provide information on additional resources or services that are available in the community. And CASA volunteers also monitor the implementation of services. And also, because we are often the longest term person on a case, caseworkers will turn over, probation officers turn over, we can also be that, that um, source of information about services that were tried earlier that maybe didn't work so that we can not take up time in repeating, um, repeating those services. Um, so we, we do fill that role as well. And then um, being included in the joint team meetings, as I said before, is, is very um, crucial to success. And we have been pulled in on, on staffing where appropriate. We're happy to do that as well. And as I said, I think our strength is the knowledge and the history of, of the case um, <clears throat> and knowledge of the services that have been tried in the past. So we also try to be a, a stable influence um, and role model for the youth and a resource for the court. So CASA volunteers, too, and Lancaster County have one case at a time, so they have the time to focus on the details as well as have a view of the bigger picture. So in a nutshell, that's kind of what CASA does. This is, my slides are a little repetitive. Someone should have edited better, and that was probably me. Um, but it, the, my last point would be that crossover use cases are complex because you've got charges on both sides. You have issues being worked at um, by a lot of, of people. And CASA does complex well because our volunteers focus on one youth or one sibling group at a time. We're able to help sort out the details and provide um, information to keep the cases moving. And we're happy to have that role in the system and happy to be part of the team that's working with these kids. Thank you, Don. And you know, we, we know that um, CASAs are not involved in every crossover work around the uh, site around the country. So the fact that um, Nebraska has this resource available to it. It's, it's amazing, and uh, thank you for all you do. Folks, if you have questions for Don, please uh, submit them. Now we would like to turn it over to Judge Gendler. Again, from our perspective, the judicial leadership in Nebraska, Nebraska um, on this work has been absolutely amazing, and Judge Gendler, I know that you have been intricately involved in the development of the work in Sarpy County, so we'd love to hear your perspective on uh, crossover. Put something in the chat room that people can uh, reference as well. Um, I just want to emphasize this is not all that complicated. It sounds like this is a Chilton's car manual with all these different discussions we're having. This really isn't all that complicated. It works very smoothly in our county. We typically do these at 1 o'clock, and then our court hearings are at 2 o'clock.
or somewhere around that time, depending upon our schedule. I just want to echo what Don mentioned. CASAs are really important because sometimes that's the most familiar face in a room for a kid, which is awfully important. Um, and it, we use this statute to assure that whatever is discussed in these meetings is confidential so that people are free to speak and they know that it's not necessarily going to get back to me or anybody else in the system. Uh, what they really are going to hear and get released to me is what everybody agrees on. If there are some disagreements that need to remain private, they remain private. I, I'm not interested in prying because it's not, that's not our purpose. Um, and the big thing that I think this process does for all of us is enhance trust. Uh, because a lot of these folks that come into the court system know that nothing good happens. Unless you're here for an adoption, uh, maybe a few things in uh, the guardianship area, most people don't come to the courthouse expecting to have a good time. Um, so it's really important that as part of this process to feel like they have a right to be heard. Um, and that's what this process does. I think people feel more comfortable with the result because they've had input. We don't have that many crossover cases. I don't want to mislead anybody here. But on the ones that we do have, there's large consensus on what we should do. And in our system, which I'm sure is true in all of yours, we try and avoid removal. We try and avoid changing placement because the data shows that just doesn't work. Um, so generally speaking, in all these cases that we've had, we have uh, agreement. We have plans. Uh, that can be easily implemented uh, and a process to make sure that there's a review so that everybody has a right to be heard as to whether or not those plans actually work or if there are any discrepancies that occurred as a result. So I also put in the chat room, I referenced the statute for confidentiality and I had referenced earlier that we try and address the costs as part of this uh, meeting so that people are clear on which agency is responsible for what service, not only it, but also uh, but a lot of the hard work really is done before they come into the courtroom. Great, thank you, Judge. And and perhaps in the Q and A we can come back to the notion of information sharing and um, how you've approached that in Sarpy County uh, with the development of uh, your order. Um, but that's a really uh, succinct and, and useful oversight of how it's um, looking in, in Sarpy County, and we know that's really great work happening there. Um, I, will like, I would like to lift up one point that you made with respect to the small number of crossover youth. What we know nationally is that even in jurisdictions where it is a small number, that these are the young people that um, are requiring a lot of attention and a lot of services and really can um, take up those precious uh, system resources. So it's really incumbent on us, even if we're working in a jurisdiction where the numbers are low, that we're coordinating and collaborating because if we don't do it right, um, it really can have an impact on the way that um, our, you know, what resources are available in the long run. So it really is an investment um, in, that, in that respect. Um, with that in mind, I do want to now turn it over uh, to Dr. Um, Emily Wright to talk a little bit about some of the, the costs and benefits of going down this road and the evaluation that was conducted in Douglas County. Emily? Hi, yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm Emily Wright. I'm the Associate Director of the Nebraska Center for Justice Research. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the evaluation that we did of youth impact um, that's in Douglas County. So we had three primary purposes for the evaluation. The first was an outcome evaluation. And our primary question here was whether or not the crossover youth, youth practice model as implemented in Douglas County impacted the outcomes in the desired fashion. Our second goal was to conduct a process evaluation. Here we sought to identify the process by which CYPM was implemented in Douglas County. Um, determine how the initiative was viewed by the professionals who are involved in the process, and then determine how youth impact has changed the way that professionals work with juveniles. And then finally, we wanted to conduct a cost-benefit analysis. Here we sought to determine the cost of implementing youth impact and whether or not the initiative was saving money for the county. 
In determining the effectiveness of youth impact, we examined a wide range of outcomes. A lot of the speakers have already talked about many of these outcomes, and we did evaluate them in our evaluation. So regarding case um, processing outcomes, we found an increase in the number of youth diverted or dismissed from the system. We also found increased numbers of delinquency and dependency case closures post-identification. And finally, we found a reduction in new sustained juvenile justice petitions uh, post-identification. Regarding recidivism outcomes, we found a reduced likelihood of new arrests nine months after identification. We also found fewer numbers of arrests nine months after identification. And we found a longer average time to recidivate among the youth um, and that the youth were being arrested for less serious or less violent crimes. And then finally, regarding the social and behavioral outcomes, we found better living situations nine months post-identification um, where the youth were preferably in the home. And we found fewer group home and congregate care placements. We found fewer detention or correctional facility placements among the crossover youth, and we tended to find improved pro-social behavior. We think that conducting a process evaluation is important since it doesn't just focus on the outcomes of the program. Instead, the process evaluation can answer questions related to who, what, why, and how the program is being implemented. For instance, who is the program serving? Is the target population being met? If not, then the program may be targeting the wrong people and is therefore more likely to fail. How is it being implemented? That is are all the, com the components of the model fully in place? If not, that's going to help you understand what you need to work on next. What's being done in the program itself? Is the team doing what it set out to do? If not, then the team members may need to be reminded of the main goals as well as their specific tasks to get everybody back on, on track. And finally, a process evaluation can help you understand why your program worked or didn't work the way that it was intended. So what kinds of barriers and successes did the team face? Those were some of the questions that we wanted to answer in our process evaluation. So what did we find in the process evaluation? We found that first, team members reported that better information sharing and increased in interagency collaboration across the child welfare and juvenile justice systems reduced the silos that tend to um, exist, right? Due to better communication and more information about the youth's case coming together at team meetings, decision makers, like the county attorney, reported that they had a more complete picture of the youth and his or her situation. And this helps them to make better, more informed decisions. And finally, all of this yielded more accurate, better, more accurate decisions resulting in improved responsiveness to crossover youth and their families and lowered the costs associated with system involvement. We also conducted a cost-benefit analysis for the CYPM that was occurring in Douglas County. And we wanted to understand if the potential savings um, to the system were worth the cost of implementing and running it. So a couple of things to think about if you're wanting to evaluate your own CYPM. First, consider doing a cost-benefit analysis. Agencies and stakeholders really value having this information. Second, try to mask individual or agency data, like salaries or benefits, because not everybody wants that information to be made easily public. Try to estimate um, a cost of implementing the program as well as administering it each year if you can. And figure out what costs and benefits you're going to count up front, because that makes it much easier to know where you're going to ask um, information from agencies and why. And we found that it costs about $60,000 to implement CYPM in Douglas County. Most of that money went to a data system upgrade to help the agencies track data on crossover youth, but some of it went to um, staffing costs and participation in initial meetings and so forth. We estimated that administering um, youth impact in Douglas County costs about $212,000 a year. Primarily, this comes in the forms of uh, salaries and benefits for various team elements, such as attorneys, 
probation, court costs, and so forth. However, we found that the annual benefits of the CYPM were about $385,000, which well exceeded both the implementation costs and the annual cost of administering the program. The benefits include savings of about four additional full-time probation officers as well as court costs saved because the program diverts about 100 youth per year. So the annual net benefit is approximately $173,000. So what can we conclude from our cost-benefit analysis? A few things. First, youth impact diverts about 100 youth from further system involvement each year. This means that the primary costs saved are in court costs and probation costs. Youth impact paid for itself in the first year of implementation. Um, we want to note that our cost-benefit analysis is pretty conservative. Um, and we also like to draw attention to the quote from some fellow criminologists who say that uh, saving a 14-year-old from a life of crime saves approximately three to six million dollars to society. So prevention is cost beneficial in this regard. And I know I'm running low on time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna speed it up. What are our overall conclusions um, of the evaluation? First, we think that uh, youth impact was effective on multiple levels at the system level. Um, it was more cost effective and produced better decision making um, for crossover cases. At the case level, it produced more efficient case processing, more case closures, and higher rates of diversion and dismissals for these crossover youth. At the team level, we found that the team process improved relationships across agencies, improved the quality of decisions that were made, and enhanced job satisfaction among team members. And finally, at the youth level, more youth were diverted from system involvement. They had lower recidivism levels and better social situations in our follow-up analyses. We already talked about how youth impact was cost effective by saving approximately $173,000 to the system each year and diverting about 100 youth per year. But we also want to emphasize that CYPM represents a best practice in the field by coordinating services across multiple systems. When you have youth who are involved in multiple systems, then a multiple system response is truly necessary. Sharing information across these systems is vital for better responses to youth, and the evidence is beginning to accumulate that this kind of coordination is effective for youth. So I wanted to provide our email addresses and NCJR's website. If you have any questions as your CYPM is rolling out, please feel free to contact us. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Wright, for that. And really um, amazing resource uh, in Nebraska for you all to consider partnering with as you look at your data and evaluation. So now we've reached the, the question and answer period uh, for our session uh, today. Thank you to all of our presenters for, for providing the information. Really uh, great. Um, presentation so far. We did have one question about the impact that this process will have on 3C cases. And Amy and Monica, I want to bring you in here. Um, for the benefit of everybody on the line, can you explain what a 3C case is and um, what the, the impact of looking at this uh, crossover population and through this practice model lens, what it might have on those cases? The comment that was provided was that in many times these uh, young people in the three C cases that they tend to fall uh, through the cracks. Um, and so what will the, the, the focus look like on these types of cases? Amy and Monica? Okay, thank you, Michael. And I'll invite Judge Gandler to, to make sure that he uh, makes sure my, make sure my comments are correct. <laughs> um, uh, 3C is within the juvenile code provides for that a youth to become a uh, ward of the state if there is severe mental health issues um, that needs to be addressed, um, liking it somewhat to a mental health commitment, if you will, more in lay terms. Um, what term did you use, Monica? Mentally ill and dangerous. Mentally ill and dangerous, correct. So um, a youth that would need supervision as a state ward because of that. Um, I, I'm not sure that 3Cs really uh, became apparent in the state much before juvenile justice reform, which really bifurcated our system so that child welfare was dealing with abuse neglect exclusively, and probation was dealing with the delinquent youth exclusively. Prior to that, 
DHHS had both, wore both of those hats. And so I think it just comes to those youth that um, have those severe issues, uh, mental health issues that really we were trying to how to get them best served. So I think that's three C's are more coming into play. But I can tell you that I don't know that any of those, many of those youth come to the attention of the county attorney without first having been in either of our systems. And so I think, again, we're going to try to avoid youth being duly adjudicated. And I think when we have better communication in regards to cases, uh, we communicate better with the county attorney to see are there alternatives for us to be able to serve that youth without there being a formal adjudication. No, I, mean, in our uh, I don't know, Judge Gindler, do you have anything no to add to that? 3A instead of a 3C. Um, but you always have to make sure that you let the mental health uh, providers drive the discussion and the result, because that's really typically what causes the behavior. It's not the youngster. It's the mental health issue that drives the behavior. A key piece is going to be making sure that we're coordinating those services, uh, both with probation and HHS, and really pulling in the regions, because the regions need to really be part of that, too, when it is a child with some pretty severe mental health issues. Great, thank you for that. So we have another another question that's come in about a payment and whether um, there are standards or policies in place regarding who will pay for services with respect to a young person who may be involved um, in both systems. So who, who will pay, probation, DHHS? Um, Judge Gendler, I, I know that you responded um, in writing to the message, but can you share a, a little bit about how you approach this in Sarpy County, and then I'd love to turn it back to Amy and Monica for your thoughts generally on this. But judge? But on those issues that are primarily child welfare, the department pays for those issues that are primarily juvenile justice, uh, probation pays for it. Um, so tracker, electronic monitoring, treatment, uh, any of that programming is going to be picked up by probation. The therapeutic portion, that's going to be picked up by the department. As I mentioned, we try not to change placement. So whatever that arrangement is remains the same. Um, and that's generally how we approach it. And we've had very little dispute, really. We had one case where the probation of the department came in and agreed to split the cost for the placement because it was a change. And it was not going to be long term. Great, thank you. Amy and Monica, your thoughts on this question? With HHS and probation, we really have that conversation to figure out what is the, the reason for the service and where does it best fit. Um, placement is one of those that, I'm not going to lie, has been a point of contention prior to crossover, and so it's, it's a big area that we are, are working on. One of the key things that we're really going to look at when we have children that need those higher levels of care, the treatment level, that we're, we're really looking at medical necessity and whether those children need that level of care, number one. We're also going to be um, deferring to Medicaid. A lot of those kids, a lot of those services are covered through Medicaid. Um, but when it comes down to making those recommendations to the court, we're doing a lot of that behind the curtain. We're, we're having those conversations ahead of time so that when we come into court, we have a clear plan of what services are going to be put in place and who's going to, who's going to ensure that those occur. I think Emily said it best, too, when they, when they saw in the study that good communication makes a huge difference. The judge said, this isn't brain surgery. It, it, it's really just simple. We, we, we need to talk. What, what, what are we trying to fix? Who's the one who's the primary role of fixing that? And they're the ones who have the cost. So we, we just need to be more purposeful about our discussions and make sure that for our judiciary, we come into court prepared with agreement so that isn't something that's the burden of the court to try to make a call on. It. And we have some instances where the court has split the cost and said we will split the cost, and, and that's worked actually fairly well when we've done it. Okay, great. And we have about a minute left, and there's one, one last question that has come in, um, so let's just take a minute to address it. It's the question of law enforcement and the role that law enforcement plays on the front end of the system in terms of um, identifying risk factors, looking at a young person's peer groups, um, and their interactions in the community. Can you say a little bit of the role of law enforcement in the crossover work um, in Nebraska? I know I can tell you from our perspective um, the counties have been very intentional of having law enforcement at the table to have these conversations, thinking about prevention. Um, but would anyone like to quickly jump in to, to share 
the role of law well, enforcement in this work? Our county attorney's office will have conversations with law enforcement. Our probation office sometimes will have conversations. They'll also check on some other background issues. I, I'm not going to suggest it's perfect, but I, I know that there's, they've reached out to law enforcement on occasion to make sure that we've got additional information. And sometimes law enforcement has been very supportive in helping us reach some sort of uh, service for some of these youth and families and to make sure that uh, kids, for example, feel like they're protected if they've also been victimized. So we've had a lot of support from them on that issue. Yeah, thank you, Judge, for that. And, you know, for, again, from our perspective, law enforcement can play a key role in identifying those referral sources to the system, those hot spots, yeah. and fashioning those strategies I'm moving forward. All right. Well, we'll, we'll go ahead and bring it to close. Marianne, any final words? Just thank you so much to all of our presenters today. This was um, a really amazing presentation. As I mentioned, this will be on our YouTube page. Um, and so if you want to check it out, um, it will be there. And um, the, as the statewide efforts continue, um, CIP will continue to partner with probation and DHHS on the rollout. We have some resources on our website if you're interested in checking those out um, and more to come on this issue. So thank you so much to all the presenters and thank you for participating in the webinar today.